Uh, today we're going to talk about Sioux City during the 1920s and 1930s, and uh, in, in other programs I have talked about these eras uh, specifically, but I think it'll be uh, enlightening in some way to, to talk about them together as one transitioned into the other. And I've titled it Boom and Bust, and in, in general, the 1920s were a very prosperous time for Sioux City as they were for the United States as a whole, uh, but as usual, uh, th there are exceptions to that, and, and we'll get into that. And of course, the 1930s, uh, were, were a time of great economic strife, uh, particularly in the early 1930s, uh, and, uh, but also a time when a lot of things got done, uh, particularly public works. Uh, there were some uh, important business developments during that time period, and so uh, I, I think in, in both eras we'll, we'll find things that maybe uh, we did know and, and didn't know about them. So in some ways Sioux City will reflect national trends, but in other ways uh, maybe it, it will butt, uh, buck the, uh, the stream of what was going on. But I want to start out uh, with, with some images of Sioux City between 1920 and 1929. Uh, we're starting out with an aerial photograph, uh, kind of over the center part of downtown in the late 1920s. Uh, it, it kind of in the, right in the middle is, is, is Pierce Street, and we have Douglas Street over here and Nebraska Street. Uh, and this is... The, Really, most of the large structures that you see here, I, I think it's not a stretch to say that the vast majority of them were constructed between 1900 and 1920. Uh, and I, I've put some population figures to kind of show you what was going on. Really, the, the, the first 20 years of the 20th century were the last big period of rapid growth in Sioux City. Uh, and as you can see, so population grew from 33,000 in 1900 to almost 50,000 in 1910, and then all the way to over 70,000 in 1920. So the 19-teens in particular were a, were a really kind of a boom period. And the 20s were, were also good, but, but actually more modest growth here in Sioux City. It wasn't like it was in the bigger cities like New York or Chicago where there was really a big uh, uh, period of growth. Sioux City was a little more moderate during the 1920s. Now, of course, the the center of, of Sioux City's economy during this period, as it had been since the late 1880s, was the Sioux City stockyards and the meatpacking industry. So here we have an aerial photo from the 1920s, and you can see just the massive stockyards district, so we're looking toward the north over it. Down here you have the covered multi-story hog division, uh, and beyond that are the open pins of the cattle division. Over here along the river was the sheep division, uh, and we have the livestock exchange building. And then you had three big packers. Uh, you had Armour in the south, Cudahy in the middle, and Swift up, up above uh, in the north. And uh, so this was really the, the heart of what was going on in Sioux City at this, at this time. Uh, at this time, probably eight to 10,000 people worked in, in industries either directly in the stockyards and packing industry or in things related to it. Of course, this is a period when the railroad was still kind of reigned supreme, and so the railroad, the stockyards were designed uh, to work through the railroad that ran right through here. But in the early 1920s, Sioux City became the, the, uh, the world's leading, li or, or the nation's leading trucked in livestock market. And so this is a period where you're getting a transition from uh, the railroad to automobiles uh, being, uh, being the, an important part of, of transportation, if, even for things like livestock. And so uh, at this time, they had already started to develop facilities in the hog division and in the, um, and in the cattle division to unload trucks from, from local farms. And so that that was that was something that was changing during this time period. Here we have a close up. This is these are the the loading chutes uh, for to get in and off and on the the the, uh, the railroad cars into the stockyards district. We're right behind the. This is the stockyards exchange building, uh, and here's one of the way houses, which there were many of them around. Uh, and so you know this is a, a a period when Sioux City stockyards would receive three to four million head of livestock a year. Uh, and so it was really, uh, it, it, it was a very active uh, place. Now, Sioux City was also a, a very large grain market, uh, as it still is, uh, but this is a period when a lot of the grain elevators that, uh, that still exist today uh, were, were developed or expanded. And so, for instance, where ADM is today on Lewis Boulevard up uh, off of Terminal Drive, uh, at that time you had Term Terminal Dra Grain Corporation and uh, Flanley Grain uh, were, were in business. Uh, up in Leeds, where Westway Elevator is, uh, was, was uh, international milling. And at that time, international milling actually made flour here in Sioux City. And so it not only was a grain elevator, it was a, a flour mill. 
Uh, you also had the uh, Western Terminal Elevator, uh, which that, that elevator still stands. It's uh, north of the, the Gordon Drive Viaduct, uh, about halfway across at, at Steuben Street. And then the, uh, International Milling also had an old mill right in downtown Sioux City at, uh, at uh, Third and Water Street. So that was another big area of, of industry at that time. Now, there, there were all kinds of different uh, um, uh, j just miscellaneous industries as well, uh, especially automobile related. And so Albertson and company had started in the mid 19 teens as, as a machine shop, uh, but had developed into a tool making company uh, and, and it developed the Sioux uh, brand line of tools. And so it went from a little facility downtown Sioux City uh, by where Arby's is here off of Gordon Drive uh, in the early 20s, moved up uh, onto Floyd Boulevard uh, and, and developed the, this uh, the, the structure, which we know we later knew as the Sioux Tools uh, facility uh, on, on, at 28th Street and Floyd Boulevard. Uh, Sioux City was the, was the main uh, grocery wholesaling uh, center for the upper Midwest, our part of the upper Midwest anyway, uh, and that had been true since the 1880s. And one of the, the very large uh, wholesale grocery concerns at this time was the Moore Shankberg uh, grocery store, and they had two big uh, warehouses that were on, th on the north side of 3rd Street between uh, Pierce and Douglas Streets. Uh, and so, so th th these two uh, facilities. Later, th this building here was turned into one of the first parking ramps in Sioux City and was used uh, as a car parking ramp uh, into the, I think, into the 1970s. Uh, but when this picture was taking, taken, uh, they were using electric, uh, electric trucks to, to move uh, groceries off of the railroad uh, lines that w warehouses that were on the south side of Third Street into into the uh, into these warehouses. Of course, Sioux City was a major retail center uh, and it had several uh, large downtown department stores. I'm showing uh, the T.S. Martin and Company building, which was right on the site where we are today. Uh, the, the the building, the the the, uh, the actual building itself was in kind of in the, it was actually the south e uh, west cor quarter of this block, uh, but it was six stories tall. Uh, and, uh, and had opened in 1919. And so this is a period when the downtown department store, so there was uh, Mar T.S. Martin, and then there was the Davidson Brothers Company at uh, 4th and Pierce Street, which later you'd know as Yonkers, or Yonker Davidson's. Uh, and then there was uh, also Pelletier's department store, and each of these uh, employed over 500 people, and I mean, they were, they were large uh, uh, locally owned department stores. Uh, the Martins also owned hotel, the uh, Hotel Martin at uh, at Fourth and Pierce, uh, and so here we have a picture of it in in uh, in, in the early 1920s. Another. Uh, fancy hotel downtown at the time was the Chicago House Hotel uh, at 4th and Jones Streets. Uh, and uh, so this would be the northwest corner of 4th and Jones in the area kind of on the west side of the convention center today. Uh, and now when you hear stories about Al Capone in Sioux City, we'll get to this a little more. Um, sometimes you, I, I have heard stories where he stayed at the Chicago House when he came to Sioux City. Uh, you know, there's the, the, one of those things that's impossible to verify, uh, it, it, uh, but could have possibly happened. And as we'll see, his brother did live in, in our area, and there was plenty of illicit alcohol and stuff being uh, sold in Sioux City, so who knows? It, it is definitely a possibility. Uh, a new structure in the early 20s was the Masonic Temple uh, up at, uh, at, at the southeast corner of 9th and Nebraska Streets. And so this was uh, uh, for all the various Masonic groups, especially, especially the Abu Bekr Shriners, and that had just opened in uh, 1922. Uh, Sioux City at this time in the early 20s still had a uh, minor league baseball team called the Sioux City Packers uh, and they played at a at a park that was called Mizzou Park and it sat approximately where the Long Lions Rec Center is the old Sioux City Municipal Auditorium uh, is where where their park uh, was located and they had been around since the early 1900s uh, and unfortunately the the team uh, disbanded in in the in 1923. But, uh, but this is one of their later teams. 
Another uh, local institution that really got going during this period was what became the Sioux City Symphony Orchestra. Uh, it started out as the Morningside Symphony. Uh, in this picture from 1925, uh, Leo Kaczynski, who was a professor of violin out at Morningside, had just become uh, the, the director of the, uh, of the Morningside Symphony. And it, within a couple of years, it would become the Sioux City Symphony Orchestra. And so that's something we still have with us from this period. Uh, Sioux City's first municipal swimming pool, the Riverside Pool, uh, opened in 1925, and this happens to be a picture from opening day in, in uh, 1925. So, and of course, the Riverside Pool, a, a newer version of it, is still uh, an important thing for Sioux City. Now, the, the 1920s were the last e years of the uh, Sioux City Interstate Livestock Fair. Uh, and the Interstate Fair was a very large uh, event that occurred from 1904 to 1926. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was not quite as large as the Iowa State Fair, but it, it, was, very, it was a very big event. Over 100,000 people would come to the, the, the Interstate Fair uh, in, in the early 1900s. Uh, and the fairgrounds were in Riverside in the vicinity where the I-29 uh, interchange is. So kind of from the place where Mosier's Green House is all the way over to where you where Riverside Boulevard and uh, uh, Interstate 29 transition that was the old Sioux City Fairgrounds uh, and it, there were there were racetracks uh, there were um, you know, buildings and pavilions and so uh, it, it was it was a very major uh, event for this for this area in this particular picture we're kind of seeing part of the midway uh, and then on the track uh, there, there's an early uh, automobile race going on in 1926, uh, one, of the, or one of the Floyd River's uh, many floods occurred and is one of the reasons that uh, uh, has been postulated for why the Interstate Fair uh, ended up folding that year. Uh, it, it occurred in, in, uh, in, on the 18th of September, 1926. Uh, what generally happened was the Floyd River would flood when there was heavy rains in northwest Iowa near the headwaters of, of the Floyd, which are most on the main branch of the Floyd, the headwaters up around Sanborn, uh, and if there was heavy water or heavy rain, like say eight inches, five to eight inches of rain, Sioux City would get a flash flood, uh, and it had occurred several times in our history. And uh, the the Floyd River was Sioux City's number one uh, uh, flood problem for many decades, and so this happened to be one of the really bad ones. And this picture is on Fourth Street. We're on the on the uh, east end of the Fourth Street Viaduct. Uh, and we're looking back to the east, and you can see that everything from uh, from where the viaduct comes down to the ground to the east is is underwater. And so, uh, in the in the 1926 flood, uh, nobody here in Sioux City was was killed, uh, but in other floods there were, especially the 1953 flood that killed uh, 14 people. Here's another picture of the 26 flood. On this one, we're on Dace Avenue, uh, down in the, on the north part of the Stockyards District. And what we're seeing here is part of Stockyards Ballpark. So in the, in the early 20s, uh, a baseball field was, was built in, in, uh, uh, on the south side of uh, Dace Avenue at, at Steuben Street, kind of north of where Home Depot is today. Uh, and that's later where, uh, where uh, people like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig played exhibition games and where local baseball teams and the high school football teams played there and uh, was an important uh, uh, facility for Sioux City for many years afterwards. Uh, in the distance, you can see the Swift & Company uh, packing plant on Leach Avenue. Now, I've always liked this picture. So this picture was taken during the 1926 World Series. Uh, which was between the St. Louis Cardinals and the New York Yankees, and uh, what the they're they're standing in the parking lot over where the near just to the west where the Gooseman Law Firm is today, uh, and they're staring at the Sioux City Journal building, which was at at uh, the at Fifth and, and Douglas Streets. And in those days, the the local newspaper would have an electronic scoreboard, and as it was as the game was being radioed in, uh, they would they would move the little figures on the electric scoreboard, and you know in in the, in the days, you could listen to it by this point on radio, but really radio hadn't 
really gotten going in Sioux City. Uh, KSCJ was, was established in 1927, so this is just before radio was really getting going. Uh, but the journal was getting radio messages through its own private service, uh, and they were relaying the game as it was happening, and so it was a way to follow. And it would attract thousands of people. And this wasn't unique to Sioux City. People did this all over the country, but uh, this was a really great World Series where uh, the Yankees were in the middle of their, you know, one of their most powerful periods, and the St. Louis Cardinals came out of nowhere and beat them in the World Series in 1926. So that's what they're watching. In 1927, it was probably the greatest Yankees team of all time that won the World Series. Uh, it featured uh, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, and after the season was over in those days, uh, the, the players would go on these barnstorming tours uh, to make extra money. And, uh, and so anytime you know, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig would show up in a city, they would play with the local semi-pro team or whatever, uh, and they'd put together these teams and play each other and, of course, draw thousands of people just to come out and see because by this point, you know, you could, the, the era of the superstar had developed in America. Uh, and, uh, and they certainly were that. And so uh, when, when they came to Sioux City in October 1927, which was just after they won the World Series, uh, it, was, it was pandemonium when they, they played at Stockyards Ballpark. Now here we have a picture of the Orpheum Theater just after it was constructed. It opened in 1927. So that was a, a new feature for Sioux City in, in, in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, was both a, a live theater and then was also used as a movie theater. And of course, out, at, uh, out in Riverside on the north uh, side of, of the, the fairgrounds uh, was Riverview Park, uh, which was owned by Roy Warfield. And it was, it was very much like Arnold's Park, uh, is what I would compare it to. It had a roller coaster very similar to the wooden roller coaster up at Arnold's Park. Uh, and it was very much a little amusement park like that. Uh, that was featured here in Sioux City until the early 1950s, and it's something that, you know, unless you personally remember that, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that kind of thing was here in, in Sioux City. Uh, and here, finally, a, a photo of the White Horse Mounted Patrol. So the, the Abu Bekr Shriners, uh, as one of their divisions, uh, started the, their mounted patrol in the early 1920s. Uh, uh, from what I understand, originally not with all white horses, but it fr fairly quickly uh, uh, developed into the, the white horses. And so uh, they had their barns down in the stockyards area, and so they're here taking a picture out in front of the uh, Swift & Company plant uh, just uh, across the street. So now we're going to get into some of the, um, the prohibition-related uh, things that happened during the 1920s. Uh, and we'll, we'll start out with, uh, in the early 20s, Sioux City's police, and fire, or police headquarters were on 6th Street in this little building. It was right next to the City Hall at the time, which was at the uh, uh, northwest corner of 6th and Douglas Streets. And so this was just to the west of that. And so it was just a little building that had been around for uh, quite a while. And uh, you know, the, the police force in the early 20s wasn't very big. It had probably 50 people on, you know, on, the, on the police force. So we're not talking about a, uh, a large uh, force at all. Uh, the, the mayor in the early 1920s was Wallace Short. Uh, he was a former congregational minister who was a very interesting uh, person just in general. He was against prohibition and he was pro-labor. Uh, and so that, was, that got him in trouble with all kinds of constituents of people, but it made him quite popular with the uh, local working class. And so he was elected mayor three times in the early uh, 1920s. And he had all kinds of interesting uh, uh, things happen happened uh, uh, during his tenure. Uh, in the early part of his uh, time as mayor, uh, there, was, there was a terrible fire called the Ruff Disaster downtown that killed 39 people. And he was recalled after that. Uh, and he's the only mayor in Sioux City's history to ever face a recall election. Uh, but he stayed in office, uh, and then later, as we'll see, he had uh, some uh, fights with the local Ku Klux Klan, and uh, he, was, he, was, he was an interesting character in general. Uh, one of the early prohibition-related uh, 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 incidents that happened was the uh, killing of James Britton, one of the, one of the uh, Sioux City policemen that died in the line of duty, one of the very first to do so, as a matter of fact. Uh, this happened in 1919. So uh, Sioux City 
adopted state prohibition in 1916 before national prohibition. National prohibition took place in took hold in 1920. So Iowa was already dry in 1916. Well, what that did right away is there were problems with prohibition violations as soon as that took effect here in Iowa. And one of the local gangsters was Red Burzett. Uh, who we, we see here, and he had a gang, and they had uh, just recently murdered a competitor up in northern, uh, uh, up in northwest Iowa, um, and stole his liquor, and uh, and so the the police were after him, and his gang happened to be in Sioux City uh, in in 1919, in July of 1919, and uh, Britton and his uh, partner Maurice uh, uh, Morris Farley uh, were told, uh, and they cornered them over on, on West 3rd Street. At West 3rd and Ross Streets, there were streetcar barns for the, the streetcar system, and there was a little diner next to it, and Burzett and his gang were having breakfast while their, their car was being worked on, and uh, Britton and Farley uh, broke in on them and, uh, and attempted to arrest them, and a gunfight ensued, and uh, uh, Britton killed Burzett, but the, one of the other guys, Jim Davis, uh, mortally wounded Britain, uh, and uh, and so he he died. Uh, the rest of them, uh, uh, Farley and the other two gang members, lived after it. But uh, that that was one of the uh, the real incidents in the early Prohibition era. Uh, here we have the uh, Woodbury County Courthouse. It just opened in 1918. Uh, so here's a picture of it in uh, in 1920. And the uh, county attorney during this uh, time was Ollie Nagelstad. And he was the, I, I think to this day, he's the longest serving uh, Woodbury County attorney. And in those days, the county attorney had to stand for election every two years. And uh, he won eight terms. And so for most of the uh, prohibition violations, he would have been the person uh, having to deal with that. The first uh, woman elected to public office in Sioux City. Now remember, women just received the right to vote in, in uh, 1920. Uh, and the first uh, uh, local woman to hold elective office was, uh, was Catherine Stewart. Uh, and she was the Woodbury County Court, uh, Recorder uh, between 1925 and 1933. So she served uh, four terms in that office. Hi, uh, here we have a picture of a, of a bust, of a still on a house. I, we don't know exactly where this was. It looks to me like it was the near west side, uh, probably in the Perry Creek Valley somewhere. Uh, a lot of the busts were of this type, so people would make uh, illegal alcohol in their basement. It was quite easy to do. It might not have been very good alcohol, but, uh, uh, but it wasn't that hard to do. Uh, and they'd have these stills in their basement, and it was a way to make some money on the side. It was, it was very lucrative. Uh, and so a lot of your busts were kind of of a small-scale nature like this one. Uh, and then there would be larger busts. So in this one, uh, we don't know exactly where this is, but it's, these are uh, Sioux City detectives and probably a couple of federal uh, prohibition agents. Uh, but they have uncovered a shipment of, of actual bottled liquor, which usually was either from Canada uh, during the 1920s or it was from, there were bonded uh, warehouses full of, of whiskey from, uh, from before Prohibition uh, all over the country. And so the gangsters like Al Capone and his ilk uh, would get hold of, these, uh, uh, of, this, of this liquor that was already packaged and occasionally a, a, a big bust like this would, would occur. Uh, and every time they would bust up a still, they'd, it would you know, make local news. And so here we have a picture of Woodbury County Sheriff uh, Paul Beardsley breaking up a still. They'd, they'd put the stills out in front of the Woodbury County Courthouse and smash them up with, uh, you know, with, with sledgehammers and make a deal of it, showing that they were fighting the fight. Uh, another incident, not prohibition related, but another corruption type incident that occurred was so I've pointed out the Swift and Company plant a couple of times uh, previously. That, that facility was actually built for what was called the Midland Packing Company, and it was a locally financed uh, uh, Sioux City-based packer that built this facility in 1919. Uh, and it was, it was a very you know, ultra-modern plant for its time. It, it ended up costing something like $3 million, and it was financed primarily from farmers in the Sioux City area. Uh, and the, the leader of the project was uh, Ben Salinger. And so Salinger went around and uh, collected money from farmers who were hoping to profit from their investment. And then he and his associates proceeded to basically squander the money in every way they could possibly squander it. And so Midland opened for operation at the beginning of 1920 in January. 
and closed in May because it ran out of operating capital that fast. And after that, Salinger got uh, put on trial for, they actually got him, they, they tried him for mail fraud up in South Dakota uh, because one of the ways he uh, solicited uh, uh, investment money was, was through the mail. Uh, and he was, he never really served any hard time for it, but a, lo a lot of farmers lost, lost money. And so uh, that facility sat empty then, brand new facility sat empty from 1920 until 1924 when Swift and Company bought it and, and then operated it as their packing plant here in Sioux City. There was there was a real bad uh, uh, strike in the uh, um, in the in the packing industry in 1921, not just in Sioux City but throughout the nation. Now, that so, something that's not often talked about is the the, the early 1920s. So 1921, 1922 in particular, there was a real severe recession after World War One, uh, where you know there had been this boom time during the war, uh, and but there was there was a lot of people lost their jobs in the early 20s. It wasn't a particularly good time in most places, and it and it particularly at industrial jobs like the packing plants. Uh, and so there, there was a, there, there, there was a strike, and, and the strike turned violent, and uh, the gunfire ensued. And the uh, the the son of uh, of uh, County Sheriff William Jones uh, and a striker were, were killed in, in this incident. So it was one of the violent uh, labor incidents uh, during uh, that time. Well. Th the 20s were the period when Sioux City ha did have an active Ku Klux Klan uh, presence, and uh, in fact, in, in recent years, we've 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 uh, received both a, a poster of an event uh, that was held. So the, the local Klan kind of operated like a club, like a like a fraternal club, uh, and they actually owned quite a bit of property on the east end of Morningside Avenue, kind of on the edge of town, where they would have events and and uh, carnivals and things like that. And uh, a few years ago, we, we received a. Uh, a robe, a Ku Klux Klan, Klan robe from a, a man from, that was owned by a man here in Sioux City, uh, and it's it, it even has the the music emblem because he was in the band of the local Klan, and so that's how. And this was the period in in the United States when the Ku Klux Klan was at its height in the 1920s. There was there was a real, especially a reaction against all the immigration that had occurred. 1900 to 1920, after World War One was over, uh, and in Sioux City's Klan was particularly uh, focused on recent immigrants, Catholics, the Jewish population. Uh, that's who they seemed to target. Uh, Sioux City didn't. This was the era when the first uh, really fairly large immigration of African Americans came into Sioux City, but there were about a thousand uh, African Americans in Sioux City in the early 20s, so it wasn't a real large population, so it wasn't quite like it would have been down south where the Klan originated uh, in that way. It's, but there were incidents, for instance, there was a, uh, a St. Anthony's Orphanage, which was a Catholic orphanage over where Holy Spirit Retirement Home is off a of military road. There was an incident where the Klan burned a cross on the in, the, in front of their orphanage, and you know, there, there, there was there were not too many like real violent incidents, but there were things like that happened. Well, in in the, the mid twenties, Wallace Short, who was the mayor at the time, uh, got into quite a, a tussle with uh, Thomas Taggart, who was called the he was the commissioner of public safety. He was actually in those days the Sioux City was on the commission form of government. And the commissioner of public safety was one of the councilmen, the city councilmen, and he oversaw the uh, police and fire department. And uh, Short accused Taggart of being basically on the payroll of the local clan. Uh, and there was quite a, a back and forth over this publicly. And for a little while, uh, Taggart actually left office, as you can see from his dates of service, uh, but, but was brought back into office afterwards. Uh, after 1925, the, the Klan kind of dissipated all through, you know, went underground, uh, uh, really all around the, the country. And in, in, in Sioux City, you don't hear of a lot of incidents after about 1925, 1926. Uh, the, the Sioux City Police Department in, in the late 20s uh, owned a, a armored Studebaker. Uh, now, I've never really come across an incident where they got into a big shootout with anybody where they had to use this, but certainly in places like Chicago and things that, that this was a, uh, a tactic because oftentimes the gangsters were better armed than the police. Uh, and so uh, I think that is an, an example, though, of maybe some of what the, the local law enforcement was facing uh, during this time period. Uh, one of the, the speakeasies you do hear about now, there. 
it wasn't like uh, in the big cities where you had the, the fancy dance cl jazz clubs and things uh, that, that were speakeasies, but, uh, but there definitely were all kinds of places to get uh, illegal alcohol around uh, Sioux City, and probably the most uh, prominent of the, the local illegal drinking establishments uh, was in Frank's Hotel, which was right across the street from where we are now, right in front of what today is the Ho-Chunk building. Uh, and so this was, this was a, a, a hotel that was right on the alley. Uh, to the east was uh, the, wet, the old Weather Wax building. So this would have been, or this would have been to the east of the Weather Wax building. Uh, and it was owned by uh, a late, uh, Marie Bevington, it was her real name, but uh, she, she went by the, uh, the nicknamed Babe Fisher. She had been previously married, uh, and she was the second wife of Tom uh, Bevington, who was a, a prominent local attorney, and she was always getting, her place was always getting busted by the local police, but she ne always seemed to be in operation, so uh, it, it, it didn't seem like she was ever put out of business. Uh, and here, I wish I had better photos of this. The, the largest single liquor bust that was made in, in Sioux City's, uh, in the Sioux City area during Prohibition was in 1926, and it was on a farm over by Ida Grove. It was the uh, Martin Knutson farm. Uh, and they found that the, the, the Knutson built a new hog house, what everybody thought was a new hog house, and they noticed that there were lights on in it day and night, and they couldn't, you know, the neighbors couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. And one, one thing led to another, and local prohibition agents and law enforcement were informed, and they busted the, uh, they, they, they went and investigated and found this huge still operation going on where they, I, it was a full-scale uh, whiskey operation where they had, you know, tanks of thousands of gallons, and they were making uh, corn sugar whiskey for sale uh, for illegal alcohol. And at the time, uh, in 1926 anyway, it was the largest single uh, illicit liquor operation ever uncovered in the, in the United States. Now, I, it may have been surpassed after that, but, uh, uh, and this picture, if, it, if we had it, it would be really great, because it's a mixture of policemen and uh, prohibition agents, and then some of the guys that were running the still, they all got their picture taken in, in front of it. That, so by the mid 20s, the kind of the enthusiasm for prohibition had started to to wane, um, particularly because of all the violations of it and and uh, um, and just the way that uh, prohibition was handled. And so the Sioux City Tribune, which was one of the local newspapers, uh, had a, basically did a survey uh, of, of of local of their readers to see who wanted to keep prohibition, who wanted to repeal it, and who wanted to alter the to modify the law. Uh, and they, they had they picked some prominent people to serve as judges. And so, for instance, August Willigus and O.J. Moore, who were prominent businessmen, served as the wet judges. Uh, and uh, and then a couple of clergymen uh, s served as the uh, um, served as the the dry judges. Uh, and presumably to make sure that each counted the the uh, the results uh, um, you know accurately. And as you as you can see. Uh, a slightly more people wanted to keep prohibition than repeal it, but by far most people wanted to modify it. And you, generally what people meant by that was they thought things like beer or at least like 3.2 beer and light wine should be allowed, uh, but probably maybe not, uh, you know, actual spirits. Uh, and so, so by this, and this, this does reflect kind of the national, there were national surveys at this time as well, and it broke down very similarly to this uh, uh, across the country that by, by 1926 or so, um, people really thought that the prohibition law uh, overall the majority of people thought it should be changed in some way, but it did not until it was repealed in 1933. Now, getting back to uh, Al Capone, his brother, James Capone, his older brother, uh, better known as Richard Two-Gun Hart, he named himself after there was a cowboy actor named William Hart uh, of, the early, of the silent film era that was a hero of his, and so he, he especially after Al became famous as a gangster, uh, he went by, by Richard Hart as, as, his, as his name, and ironically enough, Richard Hart was a prohibition agent. He worked for the, uh, the Federal Prohibition Service and for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, he was involved in some pretty high-profile incidents. For instance, uh, uh, he was in a shootout over in South Sioux City uh, in the mid-20s where he, he killed a guy uh, and had to 
you know, it, it made the paper and, and, you know, he had to stand trial for it. Uh, and then later he was involved in some incidents out west when he was working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, but in the early 30s, he returned to the Sioux City area. He lived over in Homer, Nebraska, uh, and he served as their local justice of the peace for, for some time after that. Uh, and so I, I think a lot of the, if, if Al Capone was in the Sioux City area, it, I, from what I understand, uh, Hart's was, was on good terms with Al, as, you know, personally, and that certainly his family was uh, in later years, uh, and so I see no reason why Al Capone wouldn't have been here, but there, there's no good hardcore evidence of it that I've ever seen, but if there is any, hopefully we'll get some someday. So now we're going to go into the 1930s. Uh, so during the 1920s, in general, Sioux City was a very prosperous place, as the rest of the United States was, but there were uh, certain areas of the economy that didn't do so well, and one of them was agriculture. And really, agriculture struggled all from the end of World War I uh, until, the, until the outbreak of World War II. It was, it was, a, it was a bad 20 years for, for agriculture uh, in the United States. And you see this some with uh, the, 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 the average price of farm labor that I was able to find going back to 1869. And you can see that in the late 19th, early 20th century, wages were real, and we're gonna see this in other ways, prices of all things were real stable through that whole period after the Civil War until about 1910. Uh, it, it, was, it was a period where the price of everything barely changed in a whole person's life. Uh, it was some, sometimes it's called the great deflation of that period. Um, and so there was real stable prices. Beginning about 1910, farm labor started going up. People, there were other opportunities in business. And so the, the kind of, in those days, a lot of people just worked as itinerant farm workers, especially young men, uh, or worked as hired hands uh, and weren't farmers themselves. And so this was an important statistic. As you can see, by 1920, Farm labor had gone up to three dollars and fifty-six cents uh, per day, uh, which was was a very high wage for that that line of work. And but it actually went down during the twenties, and I think that shows that uh, the, the the ag economy was was pretty stagnant during the nineteen twenties. Now, the other thing that it's, is reflected, and this will get us into the 1930s, are commodity prices, like important ones like uh, cattle, hogs, and corn. As you can see, the, the, that, that real stable pricing from 1870 to 1910 kind of plays out with pretty much everything, with cattle, hogs, and, uh, and corn. Uh, the, the, the prices don't fluctuate too much. Uh, but in that World War I period, that, the period 1910 to 1920, that was the best period in American agriculture ever from a, like a pricing standpoint and the introduction of new technology, that was, that was a real high, high point in, in many ways. Uh, but in the early 20s, especially when the European countries started getting their agriculture going again, prices collapsed and they really didn't recover until World War II uh, in many ways. And so uh, I believe to this day, the price parity index that the USDA keeps um, it's based on 1919 prices, and I did some figuring with an inflation calculator. Uh, so in 1990, corn hit a high of $1.51, and if a bushel, and if you if you adjust that for inflation, that'd be $23.50 a bushel today. And right now, corn's actually higher than it's been in four or five years, and it's like 6.60 a bushel, uh, which is about twice as much as it was a couple of years ago. So so so. Today, you know, corn sells for a lot less, actually, than it did back in this time period. Uh, hogs and cattle are similar. Um, they, they hit a peak, both of them uh, hit a peak in 1919, although cattle topped out in, in 1930. Uh, but hogs, again, today, a, 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 a hog today, if sold at that 1919 price of $22.18, would be something like $345 for uh, a, Today, so it, which is which is a, about a hundred. Even though hogs are at a, like a all-time uh, high right now, uh, it would be like a hundred dollars more than you could get right now. So it, the, the pricing cattle are a little bit different, but uh, in all that was that was a real peak, and then it was just all downhill from there. And particularly in the 1930s, you could see that in 1930, between 32 and 34, prices just bottomed out uh, and were just a fraction of what they had been. Uh, 10 years earlier. And so uh, I, I think that explains a lot of, especially the rural unrest that occurred in 1932, 1933 in our area. 
very desperate time. So in 1932, there was an incident called the Sioux City Milk War. Uh, and what this was, basically milk prices had fallen so low locally that uh, you know, local farmers couldn't get their cost of production back by selling it to the local dairies. Uh, and so they set up barricades around Sioux City and prevented, tried to prevent people from bringing milk to Sioux City to sell it at a loss and just started giving it away at, at different places around Sioux City. And so they set up the station at what was called the City Market, which was over at West 8th and Bluff Street. And they're just giving their milk away rather than sell it to the local dairies at a loss is what's going on here. Um, here's a picture of, of the, there was an organization called the Farmers Holiday Association that was kind of an attempt to, to organize farmers locally uh, to get them to, to sell their, their uh, to agree to only sell their um, uh, produce when they could uh, make a profit. Uh, and so these are members of the Farmers Holiday Association standing outside the north entrance to the Woodbury County Courthouse uh, and, and obviously looking to get an audience with uh, some local officials and kind of intimidating looking actually. Uh, here's an example of a barricade. Uh, this is probably, the, 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 the truck has a little plaque uh, saying, uh, talking about the Webster City, uh, the county fair over by Webster City. So this could have been out, outside of Sioux City, but this is an example of how members of the, the, the farmers would get together and they would block off the, uh, the roads so that you couldn't deliver because these, these, uh, the you know, these cows are probably destined for the Sioux City stockyards and they wanted to keep them from delivering those cows uh, and, and selling them at a loss. Uh, and of course, so the, this is the time when people went broke in, in farming. Uh, the, it, it really, it, it can be traced back to the early 20s because during World War I, when things were good, farmers bought additional land, they invested in, uh, in things like tractors and things for the first time. And so they, they had quite a debt burden in the early 20s. And then when, uh, when uh, the commodity prices collapsed, uh, they just had a real hard time uh, paying back their debts. Uh, and that was continued then into the 30s, and then so when prices really collapsed in the early 1930s, it just was an untenable situation for a lot of farmers, and so, uh, you know, just hundreds uh, lost their farms uh, in, in all through, well, all across the country. And so here's an example of a, of a sale where a bank's trying to recoup some of its loss by uh, selling. Although prices were so low in everything at this time, banks couldn't really even recover their prices through, you know, the sale of land and things either. But in this picture, there are National Guard troops on hand to ensure that there's not a violent confrontation uh, amongst the crowd there. And here we have a violent incident. Uh, R.D. Markle uh, was trying to uh, deliver, uh, he was delivering uh, some, uh, some milk to Sioux City. And he's over on Military Road coming into Riverside when a, a group of farmers holiday people uh, stopped him and actually fired shots at his car and, and uh, wounded him so you see his truck. Now fortunately he wasn't killed but, uh, but that was the kind of thing that was going on uh, at this time. Uh, and here in 1933 the, the Woodbury County Sheriff actually escorted a caravan of livestock trucks to the stockyards and they're lined up along Correctionville Road uh, in, in the Greenville area uh, coming into Sioux City. Uh, now the kind of the, the this whole era kind of peaked uh, in in with an incident in 1933 where farmers up in Plymouth County uh, kidnapped a judge up in Lamar's and tarred and feathered him and almost hung him before the authorities uh, were able to stop him. And there was a period where the governor of Iowa declared martial law in Plymouth County for a while uh, and to, before things settled down. And that particular incident seemed to, I, I think most people, even though there was much sympathy for the farmer's situation, that kind of thing uh, was seen as a step too far. And really, the, the, this, these types of incidents didn't occur after late 1933 or so. That, that kind of thing uh, uh, started to go by the wayside. Another thing that would happen, though, were banks collapsed. And uh, banking was much different in, in before 1933, where, um, for instance, if you got a loan, uh, from a bank to, you know, say buy your house, you didn't actually, it was very much like uh, when you buy a car where you don't get the title until you actually pay the, <laughs> pay the debt off, where it, it, that was something that changed in the 30s is where when you buy a house, you own the house even though you're paying the bank for it for 30 years, but, uh, but you actually have the ability to sell it and for your own, on your own schedule. Uh, that was not true before, and so you could have 
you know, been paying on your house for, say, 20 years, and something happens, you get hurt, lose your job, can't make your payment, and you, you just, you lose, you know, everything. The, the, and it, it was just a very different thing. Banks were a lot riskier. Uh, this is before the FDIC, which was put in place after these years. And so people lost uh, their money very, you know, in, in these incidents. And so this is the Sioux National Bank, uh, which was at uh, Fourth and Pierce Streets. And in 1931, it, it collapsed. It uh, was heavily invested in local uh, farms. And because of the situation there, it got overextended and, and, uh, and collapsed. And so anybody that had, there was no FDIC, so anybody that had money at the Sioux National Bank lost everything they had you know, their life savings. It was, it was, a, it was a bad, this was the worst point of the depression in many ways, because things like that were happening, and there was no, no real fallback. Uh, here we have a picture of the, what had been the police uh, headquarters. This is City Hall at the time. This was that police headquarters that I showed you earlier, and uh, uh, this is a crowd standing out of what was called the Social Agencies Building, which was uh, the local, uh, you know, charity groups uh, were, were organized in that building, and people are looking for relief of some sort because of their situation. Uh, in 1938, there was another pretty severe uh, strike at the uh, Swift & Company plant. Uh, there were not any uh, terribly violent incidents this time, uh, but there were National Guard troops were brought in to kind of oversee the situation. So in, in the 1930s, there, there was also a, a crime continued unabated, uh, even after prohibition was repealed. Uh, we see a picture of what was the new uh, police and fire headquarters that opened in 1924 uh, at 6th and Water Streets. Uh, and so that, that was both the, the uh, county jail, it was the police uh, station and the, uh, the, the, the main fire station. The, the uh, mayor of Sioux City for most of the 1930s was William D. Hayes, uh, and he, was, he had a different background. He was a, uh, a bacteriologist. He came to Sioux City in the late teens and served as the local health um, administrator for, for the city of Sioux City. Uh, and later, after he, uh, his time as mayor ended, he went to the University of Oklahoma and was a professor and uh, um, uh, uh, really quite an acclaimed, uh, uh, basically a microbiologist of that time period. There were still, even after Prohibition was repealed in 1933, there, was, there were always illico illegal liquor raids going on because as soon as Prohibition was repealed, if you didn't pay the right amount of taxes, uh, it, it was illegal. And so there was, there was money to be gained by selling untaxed liquor. And so the local authorities were always uh, busting uh, stashes of untaxed uh, liquor that were being brought in from out of state, uh, either from Nebraska or South Dakota, uh, and seizing them. Because for many years after, from uh, the repeal of Prohibition on, uh, particularly for uh, spirits uh, or for liquor, you had to buy from a, a state, an Iowa state liquor store. Uh, you couldn't just buy it at the grocery store. And so it, it was a very different thing. If you didn't buy it that way, it was illegal in, in Iowa to have those kinds of things. Uh, there was some local corruption, official corruption in the Sioux City government during the 30s. One of the uh, cases was uh, Frank uh, Price Smith, uh, who was the uh, local uh, um, Woodbury County uh, treasurer. Uh, he came in to office in 1933, uh, and with that, before too long, financial irregularities came up in his administration, uh, and he was investigated, and eventually he was suspended from office, uh, and ended up taking a couple thousand dollars from, uh, from county funds and fleeing Sioux City and was found out in Nebraska, I think down by Pender. Uh, they finally tracked him down and, and uh, uh, he ended up doing a little bit of, well, he's removed from office and I don't think he did any serious time, but he, he was a, uh, a questionable politician of this period. And probably the biggest uh, uh, local corruption incident uh, involved County Attorney Max Duckworth. Uh, and Max Duckworth was a highly respected figure. He'd been the assistant Woodbury County Attorney for many years uh, under uh, Ollie Nagelstad. And uh, so he succeeded uh, Nagelstad uh, and then got caught up in a, uh, a liquor ring in Iowa that involved the Iowa Attorney General uh, where they were involved in uh, illegal alcohol uh, incidents. And, uh, um, 
He, he would never was actually convicted of it. He, he uh, agreed to testify against the Iowa um, uh, Attorney General and then ended up pleading the fifth when it was time to, to, uh, um, to make the case. And eventually the Attorney General was, the, the charges were dropped and no one actually uh, w was convicted. And so uh, he managed to get out of it, but it was, he was definitely involved in, in some shenanigans. I, and so here we have, we'll finish up with a few uh, pictures of Sioux City in the, in, the, in the 1930s. Here we have another aerial view uh, in, in the early 1930s of downtown. Uh, it, you can see by the population figures, there, were, there was growth during the 1920s, about 8,000 additional people. And so Sioux City was pushing 80,000 people in 1930. And it actually grew a little bit even during the 1930s, a couple thousand more uh, came. So that by 1940, Sioux City had 82,000 uh, people. And so roughly, Sioux City has been roughly the same size at least since 1930. Uh, it, it, it peaked a little at a little more in the early 1960s at close to 90,000. And, uh, and it's kind of settled at that early or low 80,000s ever since. Uh, of course, in the, at the end of the 1920s, the Badro Building at 4th and Jackson uh, opened uh, in, in 1930. And the Warrior Hotel, recently in, renovated, uh, opened in 1930 as well at, uh, at 6th and Nebraska Streets. This is a picture soon after its opening. So when, uh, uh, when Prohibition ended in 1933, what had been the old Interstate Brewing Company out on uh, West First and Isabella Streets uh, uh, was reopened as the Sioux City Brewing Company, and they, were, they uh, operated here in Sioux City until the early 1960s. Uh, and so this is uh, where um, Interstate Powder Coating is today. It's still the, the main building is, st is still in use. Uh, here we have a picture in the in the East Bottoms neighborhood. So the area east of of uh, downtown, uh, kind of centered on Sixth Street, and uh, it, it was a it was a uh, working class neighborhood uh, uh, north of the uh, of the, the uh, Gordon Drive Viaduct, uh, in a, a place where there was a lot of, of small houses. And so this is a good example of the kind of, of densely packed uh, houses that were in the, those na that neighborhood uh, during that period. You can see 6th Street hadn't been paved. It was still a, a dirt, uh, dirt road in the, in the early 30s. Uh, this is where the, uh, the, the, Mary Tra the community house started uh, in, in the early 1920s uh, to help uh, immigrants to, to, uh, to recently ar arrived immigrants to uh, uh, become acclimated to uh, life in the United States and to help uh, people, especially in, in the poorer neighborhoods. And of course, the main figure in that was uh, Mary Trelia, who was involved in its founding and was its director uh, for over 30 years. Uh, and in 1934, the community house uh, built a, a, a building at uh, 6th and Morgan Streets, which today would be right in the middle of the Floyd River Channel. Uh, but uh, it, that was kind of the center of the, the east side or the east bottoms neighborhood. There's another very bad Floyd River flood in 1934. Uh, and you can see the, the Swift and Company plant was uh, underwater on, on Leach Avenue here. I have another view. So this picture, there were a few houses uh, just to the north of the what would be the east end of the of the Gordon Drive Viaduct today, um, <clears throat> that were right close to the river, and so you can see they're completely inundated uh, from this. Oh, and let's finish up with uh, so we have uh, the the Sioux City Ghost baseball team, which was an all uh, black uh, baseball team that very much operated like the uh, Harlem Globetrotters, uh, where they would uh, they would play any team that, that would play them, mostly in softball. They also played baseball and basketball, uh, and they but they were quite famous for their uh, shadow ball routine, in which they would uh, pretend like they were throwing a ball all over the place, and there were actually no ball. But they uh, it, and it was done for comedic effect. But they were also excellent players and uh, the the glow the uh, the ghosts uh, traveled the United States from the 1930s through the 1950s uh, in different uh, variations another Sioux City minor league team started in the 1930s the the Sioux City Cowboys uh, the first team in 1934 and they operated until right on the eve of World War II 
Well, and we're going to have to finish up there today just with another final aerial view uh, in, in 1939 of what uh, Sioux City looked like. And so I've always loved this uh, view of downtown Sioux City. And this really shows the, the South Bottoms neighborhood, uh, which was another working class neighborhood uh, and right close to the stockyards area over here. And so um, that, that kind of gives you an idea of the, the uh, transition between uh, the 1920s and the 1930s.